welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and thank you for being really patient uh, with the release of uh, episode 68. I recently took a month off doing the podcast, uh, had a lot of travel for our seminars with Danny Lennon of Sigma Nutrition. I also competed uh, in my first powerlifting meet since 2016 and I've been working on various projects such as our online physique contest prep course, uh, our mentorship and a number of other uh, things that we've got uh, in, the, in the works at JPS. So yes, lots happening and just a quick uh, announcement, our online physique contest prep course is now open for enrollment. It starts on May 6th uh, this year. And just in case you're wondering, uh, our mentorship students get access to this course and all other courses that we release for free. Uh, so if you wanna take advantage of not only getting access to the online physique contest prep course, but also all of our seminars, presentations, uh, mentorship itself, and plenty of other resources, including all of our upcoming courses, which we have uh, in the works, uh, it's probably best to enroll in our mentorship course if you've been thinking about uh, gaining access to some of these uh, resources. And the next cohort is in September, so you can enroll for that via the description box below. Or if you just wanna check out the physique course, uh, you can also get that uh, independent of the mentorship. Some further announcements uh, relating to our seminars and conferences. We have quite a bit uh, going on at JPS and we've got a bit of travel as well. So we'll be presenting seminars in Melbourne, Adelaide and Sydney uh, from May through to June. We'll also be heading uh, internationally to present a hypertrophy seminar over two nights in Singapore in July, followed by the Ultimate Contest Prep Seminar with Revive Stronger in uh, Bath at Stanza Fitness uh, in July, so July 14th. Uh, so if you want to attend any of these seminars, I'll put the links for those in the description box below and hopefully we'll be coming to a city near you and I'll be able to catch you guys there. Without further ado, uh, in this episode, I have AJ Morris. He's a competitive bodybuilder and coach, 2017 world junior champion, and an athlete who has some very unique perspectives on bodybuilding. I've been following AJ for a few years now, and I really like his approach to training and competing. And in today's episode, we discuss many of his perspectives on bodybuilding and coaching. I think AJ is a really good example of somebody who pays attention, learns from his experiences and mistakes, uh, always seeks for improvement, and is willing to refine his approach. And I'm sure you guys are going to take a lot away from this episode. And what was really cool about chatting with AJ was that when we started the Skype, there were no formal introductions. We got talking and the conversation rolled on uh, and just we, we chatted. It was fantastic. And I think that highlights just how relatable AJ is and why uh, he is a really uh, effective and successful coach. So without further ado, AJ Morris. AJ. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing? Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you very much. That's looks good. nice and sunny where you are. You outside. I am outside. I have two daughters under the age of uh, four. Okay. So uh, being inside, I've got two choices. One, I can go into my office which doesn't have a lock, um, meaning that they can access that at any stage, or two, I can go outside and lock them inside with their mum. So, so op option two is much safer, means I won't get interrupted during the podcast. Yeah, sure, perfect. Yeah. Cool, yeah. cool. <laughs> How you been doing? Yeah, I'm good. I've just pretty much come up to the end of uh, this, this mesocycle, so I'm Pretty, pretty fried up. I uh, had a lot of PBs recently, so um, ready for a deload. Um, my approach to deloading is perhaps different to maybe your approach. I'm not sure. Um, but I tend to just take straight time off the gym. Um, I've seen it's been the best and the most productive way for me to reduce, reduce fatigue. I'm one of those people that I need to be removed from the gym environment. I, I, I suck at going in and deloading. Um, so, so, so for me, I just don't go. Um, I just rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, well, I don't disagree with that at all. I think the principle, the principle of fatigue management, is to minimize fatigue. So, you know, there are yeah. endless, yeah. endless ways to do that. Um, For sure, absolutely. And and I totally get that you're you're someone who would have a more difficult time holding back when you're in the gym. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. So, For sure. So if that works for you, man, then that makes total sense. 
How long do you generally it does, take, take uh, off? Usually four days is is about right. Um, I, I do measure some interesting things with like biofeedback as well. So I, I sometimes measure my heart rate variability and I tend to track that over the course of a deload as well. And that tends to coincide. If I've tracked it consistently, it tends to coincide with when I'm about ready to go. Because I think for stubborn people that are very consistent with what they do, measuring these things can sometimes offer a little bit of added benefit because it tells us when we're ready to go, not when just our stubborn mindset is ready to go. Like if I wanted to train tomorrow and someone forced a gun to my head and said, you have to train, I would definitely do it. Um, but I know that it's not right. Um, so I said, yeah, I tend to see a correlation with my readiness to train um, through heart rate variability coming back into a little bit of a better place for me. Um, and then I just, I, I tend to slowly ramp up a little bit. I've done the whole go back to where I was and that, that, that's, that doesn't work either. I overreach really fast again. Um, again, just being stubborn. So yeah. you learn these things and I'm still learning a lot. I, do, I still don't think I've got it nailed whatsoever. Um, at all. I think I've still got a lot to learn when it comes to knowing what works for me and obviously clients as well. Yeah, man. No, I think um, the fact that you're very aware of your probably your biggest strength, but you're also your biggest weakness at the same time um, is <laughs> obviously just how mentally strong you are. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, having I've seen, I've definitely seen that with a lot of athletes, uh, as I mentioned, their strength is a double-edged sword. Uh, whatever it is that makes them. A great athlete um, is usually something they need to keep in check um, because it can be the downfall. Um, so, as you mentioned, you really like to push things um, and you struggle to, to hold back when you're in the gym. Um, so this is a big week. This is a big strength. Uh, and how did you develop that? Have you had that since? The first time you stepped into the gym, were you just a crazy little kid who was just like, give me the freaking 20 kilo dumbbells and just went ham? Or was it something that you've developed as a result of um, you know, the environments you're in? It's probably a combination of both nature and nurture, but um, yeah, what, what was the uh, process? It's a good question because it definitely leads me down a rabbit hole of, of thinking why I'm like that. So I think for me, it's it's more so within my background of, of being competitive. Like when I was younger, a few people that have listened to other podcasts with me on or um, have listened to me speak before will know that I raced in motorsport. Um, and I was already at a downfall or a disadvantage from a financial perspective. I didn't have super sponsors. I wasn't able to get out and race or practice every weekend with the, the best quality products and engines and chassis and things like that. So like for, for me, I was always always on the back foot. So I felt like I had to do absolutely everything on my end to be able to, to be the best person that I could be from an athlete perspective. So I always worked on what I could do from a non-financially burdening perspective. So I think that's kind of ingrained into me within bodybuilding. It's like if there's something more I can do, then I will do it. Um, and sometimes, like you, you're very correct, Jacob, it actually shoots yourself in the foot a little bit. Um, and I've shot myself in the foot in various aspects with this mentality. I've, I've potentially pushed too hard in dieting phases and, and maybe lost muscle mass as a result. Um, I've uh, maybe pushed too hard in mesocycles and got injured and hurt. Um, but I think all of these processes, like if you look at anyone like that's super successful in any sort of sport especially within our industry of powerlifting bodybuilding like at some point they've done something stupid um because they've been pushing themselves to extreme limits like bodybuilding is not a normal sport it's actually a very extreme sport so to to be able to take your body to those extremes requires at some point some some mess ups along the along along the way whilst you learn um so I think it's probably ingrained from from that aspect when I was younger, to be honest, Jacob. Um, and I think it's developed even more so within bodybuilding because, like I said, it is just super extreme. Um, and I'm super competitive when it comes to bodybuilding. Um, I, when I when I sort of think about my sessions and when I think about competing, I, 
I don't I don't tend to like the whole quote of especially within bodybuilding I don't tend to like the whole quote of like it's you versus you or you know it's a chase of bettering yourself and and it is it is in a case but I don't like that wholeheartedly because at the end of the day you're not competing against yourself on on a stage you've got seven eight nine ten other guys that you've got to beat and it's up to you as to how you decide to beat those people and for me I think it's just I don't leave any stone unturned when it comes to my training, when it comes to my nutrition. I won't, I won't be a gram out. I won't be, I won't be a meal away. I won't be, I won't have anything out of, out of sync. And um, certainly, certainly that's not the approach that everyone wants to take. And that's cool. And there's plenty of people out there that can get fantastic results and potentially even better results than me who are like more genetically endowed and, I don't have superb genetics. I don't think I do at all. So um, I've got to be be willing to work super duper hard um, to be able to elicit the results that I want to see on a bodybuilding stage. Um, so so yeah, I hope I hope that answer makes sense. Yeah, no, it certainly did. And a couple of things I want to ask you about that. Um, where do you find competition? So, firstly, you spoke about how it's not a competition against yourself. So. I'm interested to know who it is you're competing against because you did win yeah. uh, you, the Worlds in juniors. Yeah. What was it, 2018? 2017. 17, 17, 17. Yeah. Man, time goes fast. Um, yeah, it does, it does. Yeah, I was yeah. following you like before that um, and I was like, wow, this kid, he's done it. And um, that, was, <laughs> that was like, yeah, a year and a half ago now, wow. Um <laughs> It was so, a big, yeah, yeah. yeah, so who are you competing against? If the, I guess, the benchmark, you know, in your age group has, uh, you know, obviously been exceeded. And yeah. if you're not quite ready for, say, the pro stage or men's open yet, because you're in that really sticky situation where you've come out of juniors, you're at the top of the game in the juniors, um, you know, not as a function of muscle mass necessarily. Um, I was in a similar position to when I came out of juniors. Um, you know, I, I could just starve myself essentially, so that's how I won. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, ser yeah. <laughs> seriously disadvantaged in terms of uh, muscle mass going straight into the men's, uh, men's yeah. open class, um, which means that you need a good off-season in between. So who is your competition and... How do you use them as a benchmark? Because it is a very um, unique sport in that it's highly subjective. There's a lot of differences uh, between individuals. Yes, there's some basic criteria that the judges are looking for, but we have genetic and individual differences in terms of uh, height, um, you know, muscle insertions, the you know, the muscle bellies themselves, um, all of these sorts of things. So, how do you make that comparison as objective as possible? Um, and wh who is the benchmark? I think the benchmark for me, if I was to literally say a name, is someone like Brian Whitaker or Ben Howard. Those are that's that's the aim. Like that's the goal. Um, I want to be a lightweight WMBF pro that's competitive in an overall lineup. That's the goal. Yeah. So to do that takes time and lots of it. And I know the importance of time. And um, I'm seeing and. Actually, my girlfriend who coaches as well, we're seeing quite a shift in the industry of people actually willing to give time to the sport a little bit more, especially over on this side. And the UK, I'm not too sure about Australia. I'm not too sure about the States. I think in the States, they have big issues with people wanting to do it now still and not willing to give the time. Maybe, maybe that's down. I mean, Australia is actually incredibly competitive. So you have you have it hard, like you have it hard at your level. Um, but in the States, there's lots and I'd be fine saying this. There's lots of easy shows. There's lots of easy shows. You turn up, you you maybe do a super pro qualifier, and there's lots of pros out there that pr pretty blue, pretty honest with you, Jacob, shouldn't be pros um, because they're not they're not professional level yet. Um, in the UK, it's super hard. If you're a pro, you're you're a fantastic pro. You have to win the overall at the UK finals to to win your pro card. So that's that's you want to qualify, want a regional show, and then you go to the, the British finals, you win your class, and then you win the overall. That's the only chance you get at the pro card. Um, so our pro that got the pro card this year went straight to WMBF Worlds in the pro class and got second. Arguably, he should have won it. 
and then arguably he would have been one of the one of the best in the, in the overall so therefore one of the best in the world so like if i want to do it if i want to get my pro card even at a, even in the uk um i mean for me most likely the route would be win at a uk level and get qualified for the wmbf worlds as an amateur and then win my class at amateur worlds that would probably be the most likely scenario because if you think about it a lightweight winning an overall lineup against the middle and the heavy the middle and the heavy would have to be meh for me to stand a super chance at doing that um i'd have to tick really all the boxes on that day to be able to do that um but yeah for me the the sort of the goal is to is, is to be, be be like Ben, be like Brian, and just emulate that kind of conditioning, that kind of separation and density that those guys have got. And if you look at how strong Ben is, if you look at how strong Brian is or was before he's got, got hurt, unfortunately, I think he's on his way back now. Maybe you know more than me, but I think he did have a pretty bad knee issue. Um, so at that that level of density just takes takes years and time under, under the bar. Um, so my, my goal and my focus is just to, at this stage, get get stupidly strong for a 22-year-old. And then hopefully I'll have the density of maybe a 26 or 27-year-old because it doesn't make sense. That's how it should be like silly strength. So if I get silly strong across multiple rep ranges with multiple movements, I should have <laughs> a potentially similar density to, to, to those that are older than me, which is then going to make me more competitive um so i'm thinking that far up to be honest jacob i'm not i'm not so much thinking and this even when i was a junior like i was comparing myself to like people way ahead of me i've always been like that um because then i think when i turn up at regional qualifiers as a junior like i shocked a lot of people um and pr pretty much battled my own held my own in in the overall lineups and when when you're doing that at, you know 21 years old it just it's a case of just setting the ballpark quite like quite quite a lot higher than than you'd like to set it and then you will turn up at these shows and do really really well um i think a lot of people set their goals far too low um i've had clients come to me and say oh, i just want to do like top three at a regional i'm like well if you do what you want to do like top three at a regional then why not take out more time like if you think you're only top three at a regional at the moment if you're really that then take out more time um, cause you're spending a whole year dieting just to come top three at regional. Um, Excuse me. So from my perspective, setting goals super, super high. I think more people should do that. Um, so, yeah, that's my, my general thoughts on that one. Yeah, I like it. I really like it. I am actually very similar. So, AJ, I'm not sure if you know this, but last time I competed 2013, I was yeah, 20. You did a prep last year, didn't you, but then didn't, yeah, didn't end up competing. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So like half, half prep. Yeah. Half prep. Um, so I was actually, yeah, junior state champion and came second at nationals. I'm not sure if you know Eddie Ong. I, I've heard of Ong as a surname, but I'm not sure. I can't visualize right. his physique, so, but I'm sure it's good. So I lost to him at uh, Open Nationals as a junior. Sure. And he went on to win Worlds. He's got a crazy physique. If you have a look at it, you'll be like, oh, my God. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I totally understand because I was always – uh, training, comparing myself to uh, you know guys who had years of experience, um, and I wanted to compete against them. I didn't even want to compete in juniors um, because I just wanted to push myself. But um, moving from your obviously comparison and how that is what being competitive is what makes you uh, AJ. Um, I also want to discuss some of the times where you have realized uh, or that have taught you that your mental strength can be a double-edged sword like when have there been experiences where you've gone oh shit okay my body can't handle this I shouldn't have you know pushed that hard um, and how do you manage that moving forward because I was quite similar when I was your age in that I was very headstrong people told yeah. me don't do something I can do it I'll prove you wrong. Um, and literally, like, there was no limits because I knew that if I put my mind to it, I could do it. But age has humbled me. So <laughs> I feel whilst you're still young, um, you were very much in the prime of this, uh, you know, almost like psychotic ability to just go to places that you shouldn't be able to go. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so when have there yeah. been experiences where you've learned and realized, oh shit, I got to tone this down? Yeah, and I do you want to comment on that one a little bit with regards to you. I think that attribute of you is why you've built the business that you have now. Like that stubbornness, that relentlessness that you have is probably why you are where you are today because you're willing to do what a lot of people aren't willing to do. It's why people, it's why a lot of people don't have successful businesses because they're not willing to put in the hours that you've probably put into what you do. So I think the attribute is a good one in, in a lot of ways. Um, but in terms of being like a negative one, I think for me most recently, um, I I pushed far too too long and hard in, into a mesocycle and I, I, I got I got one. Have you ever had one of these things? Uh, Steve Hall's had one. They're called exertion headaches. Yeah. Um, they are horrendous. Um, and when you get one bad and you keep training through it, so I had one for like a week and I just kept training through it. I was like, ah, I can get through this. And I was in immense amounts of pain throughout the majority of the day, not just the training session, but the day. And it was affecting my ability to, to even do just basic work. So, so that's how far I would just drive myself into the ground. And because I, I knew the ability for me to create power output in the gym and still continue to actually hit new numbers was there. I just keep wanting to go and do it because I feel like not doing it wouldn't do me justice. And, and that's just not purposeful at all. Um, and it ended me, ended me up in taking actually quite a significant amount of time away from the gym. And you know what? Every time I do that, every time I take time away from the gym, I understand just the pure gratitude that I have for the ability to just go and train. And even if it's not a PB, even if it's not a PB day, even if it's not like a, you know, a day where I've progressed, if just going into the gym and lifting stuff. For me, that 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 just does it. That that's fine um, for a lot of the time. Um, obviously, I'm very fueled by progression, but um, ultimately, just the gratitude that I have when I come away from a time period of being sick or ill or overreached is huge. Um, so, so that that for me is is I, I'm realizing that more and more to understand my body. And this time, I'm pretty much I'm pretty sure I've nailed it um, in terms of just like I've just come off the the, the back of. A few really good sessions that have been hard. They have been hard to to progress or um, to even match previous numbers. And warm ups have felt slower and sleep starting to get a little bit iffy. But it's not as bad as it usually is. So I've decided to to pull back just before then. And that's taken me like a long time to learn. Um, compare that to my prep. Like Jacob, I'll be honest with you. I don't think I deloaded really like once. Um, in my entire prep and that was just pure stupidity pure stupidity if you look at that from a, a basic periodization standpoint it's just silly but my mindset at that point i just mentally like well more so psychologically a week of deloading would have set me back psychologically so much more than the benefits that i was seeing in, in reducing fatigue um i had my weeks where i definitely pulled back in volume but I never really pulled back in intensity. So if you look at that from a, a reducing fatigue standpoint, obviously we're going to get some reduction of fatigue from reducing volume, but we're not going to fully see like neural capacity recover and things like that when we're still training at peak capacity from an intensity standpoint every single week. So I was at the end of that prep not in a good place. And, and, and that's – that's where most people end up preps, to be honest, is that at the end of the prep, like people think, oh, it's grow time. It's not grow time. You're not in a position to grow when you finish the prep. It's like your first port of call is is to recover. Um, and that's what I did. Luckily, for a long period of time, because of accumulated fatigue, I just had to give my body a rest at the end of prep. And that was like, you know, the the cloud with a silver lining, to so to speak, because I actually managed to just give my body the rest that it needs. Um and, and throughout the prep itself, in terms of poor decision-making through being stubborn, uh, I, I certainly lost a, a, a decent degree of, of, of leg tissue, quad fullness. Um, I'd say quad fullness, it was actually just, just muscle tissue. Um, uh, if you look at shots of even over like a month period, um, I was continually keeping my output very high. So my non-exercise non uh, activity thermogenesis, keeping that seriously high from just steps, um, because again, I was on, see, the thing is I'm, what I'm quite good at is I know what will win me the show. Um, and I, I know that for me as a junior, even 
even as a junior, what would win the show for me is condition. That's it. Like that's what was going to win me the show. It's what won me all my other shows. So towards the end of the prep, the prep my mindset was i want to win the show therefore i've got to be super duper conditioned that is it so if if i was doing my steps if i was keeping my expenditure high and i was seeing that scale weight either stay the same or drop i knew i was doing my job so i knew i could lock in on that goal and i locked in on it so hard that i lost performance because my steps were too high i was pushing too hard um but that, like you said, is a double-edged sword because I'm very much aware of what's going to win me the show. I know it's not going to be size. So I just went all in on condition and it paid off. Um, I did lose tissue, but I was also a bit leaner. So arguably, you've got to weigh up the two. Um, I think if anyone's listening to this and is a junior athlete, be very mindful that your muscularity levels is going to highly dictate how con- how conditioned you can get because... A lot of the time, juniors like me, I'll have a poster in my wall of Brian Whitaker's condition and think that's the goal. When in reality, Brian Whitaker's condition is a large part, a prerequisite of his level of muscularity. Um, my level of muscularity is lower. Therefore, when I reveal all the layers, chasing that condition is just not there. And it wasn't. You know, I just pulled off more muscle for really no more condition. Um, so, so that, that's where I, 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 again, make mistakes. And I've even said to some people around me who know that I'll be prepping next year. I've said, don't allow, allow me to do this stuff. <laughs> Just tell me to stop because uh, I need to be told at some points. And that's where sometimes for me, I think, oh, would it be beneficial to have a coach? Um, and at some point it probably will, um, or would, but I am also too stubborn at some points to have, someone tell me what to do I've never liked that um I'd rather lay my ass down on the line uh than have someone else sort of decide whether I do well or not based on their decision making processes which might do me a favor (laughs) but also might 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 not might not because ultimately I do know what my strong points are and what I can give to to a bodybuilding prep so it is a bit of a miss process um but yeah that's that's pretty much that Seem to have lost your audio, Jacob. How's that? Much better. Yep, you're back. Cool. Um, so a few things I want to pick apart from there that I, I really would love your opinion on. Uh, you spoke about how juniors, when they diet down, they just look a little bit different. They don't get the conditioning um, simply as a function of muscle maturity, for lack of a more scientific word. Um, yeah. And that's obviously the density that you were speaking about earlier. So you work with a lot of juniors, which I think is awesome, number one, because you're getting all these young kids into the sport. Um, And number two, uh, it is great to see just, you know, you rally around these young kids and have this like little band and army of juniors going into comps it's fantastic um so what are some of the things that you've observed about coaching juniors um that have differed to what you've seen when you've coached uh you know athletes who are obviously let's say 22 23 or above um and yeah touch on those Cool. So, so, so most juniors are actually in a really good position to most of the time attack, attack a prep because from a responsibility aspect, their responsibilities within just general day to day life are pretty low. Um, they can, a lot of them live a relatively Jay Cutler like life as opposed to an adult who has a lot more responsibilities, maybe kids, maybe, you know, don't, so a lot of my juniors don't even have like girlfriends, etc. So, their responsibilities are somewhat lower. Um, however, they, they do come into issues like from a day-to-day aspect, uh, more so environment-based aspect in terms of just managing social events sometimes. Um, so I've found that a lot of juniors like do have some degree of social life that goes to, to shit, for lack of a better term, during, during a prep, especially if it's their first prep because they're not used to the sacrifice that bodybuilding is going to promote. Um, they try to hold on to the balance, hold on to the hold on to the lack of sacrifice a little bit too long, um, and then the intervention comes, and you, you know they start to lose that 
that balance aspect of going out with the mates on a Friday night. And they start to lose friends as, in, as, a, as, in a, as a sort of a side effect of that. So I'm very, very, very clear and concise with my athletes when I start their prep. I'm like, you know what? You, you're probably going to lose some people out of this. Um, and, and that's just the reality of it. You'll, you'll keep some, some really strong friends that support everything you do. But at some point, if you get really sucked down and you're fully, fully ready for a show – you're you're not going to be in a position where you're going to want to do much um and that's going to sacrifice some things so i'm very very clear with that from the start um and it's funny how many of them forget that initial conversation when we're halfway through and things get really really hard and they start to tell me this is a surprise that it's hard um but so there's that and then from a psychological aspect they're very resilient in a lot of ways so they can handle uh, a lot on their plate when it comes to telling them what to do and them just cracking on with it. Um, a lot of my juniors would not complain um, uh, very much from an adherence standpoint, pretty much all of them will bang on it. Um, I think this is part, partly because I kind of set the tone. Um, and I think when they, when people approach me, they, they, they want, they, they like me. They almost like in a way without sounding cocky, they do look up to me a little bit, which is fantastic from a coaching perspective because Anyone you look up to, you're going to listen to. Um, anyone that you have a slight admiration for um, or you have a, sl a slight authoritative effect, they're going to sort of think, okay, right, AJ's telling me what to do. I'm going to go and action it. Um, and a lot of them do. Um, a lot of them do. Um, I had minimal sort of occurrences of, of lack of adherence. Towards the end, two of my guys that were just sort of really, really dug out, we're talking like striated glutes, hamstrings in kind of thing, they did start to have a few adherence issues. This was more primarily between shows than anything else because they just found it really difficult to sort of lock in and attain to the next goal. Um, so, so some issues there. And then um, from a from a muscularity perspective, it's hard. It's, it really is hard because a lot of them, their initial pictures, and this is great for anyone listening, your initial pictures, you'll think, wow, I'm actually really well muscled, got a good amount of muscle, got a good amount of muscle here, here, here. All those muscle, all those point, points that you're picking out that are great, that are great at the start, sometimes they just turn into awful body parts when you diet because they're holding a ton of water, a ton of like just body fat that makes them look big. A lot of juniors have fantastic arms when they start and their arms go to rubbish when they diet. Um, they have no arms by the end of prep. It's not due to any sort of like training or loss of strength or anything like that it's more so just down to the fact that they hold more body fat in like weird areas as their muscle maturity isn't quite there whereas with a a um a competitor that's that's later on in their career you can tend to sort of see in their off-season look that okay like this is this is the level of muscle that you're at we can kind of see where we're pulling from body fat tends to come off a little bit more evenly than some juniors who hold like weird pockets of body fat maybe in their lower back and their hips um, so there is some definite differences with, with younger competitors. And then finally, and I think actually the most important topic is something that I got very much made aware of when I was sort of learning to coach younger individuals. I remember when I was, I think a year into online coaching, I think it was in 2015, maybe 2016, 3DMJ came, 3DMJ came down to London. And I remember asking Berto, uh, not actually at the seminar, we were on the way back to I was on the way back home and I bumped into him on a tube and I was talking to him about whether you should push younger guys as hard as you should push the older guys um and he was sort of the, I remember him telling me he was just like you got to remember that the, that this is like their first shot at the game and if you put them off the game for life that's kind of on your part so the point of pushing someone as a young athlete is super key so i think if you're if you're a coach out there that's coaching juniors teens really do think about like is it is it really worth doing that extra calorie drop do you need to um obviously you want to push them and i want to push them um and, and that's that's a big part of what i do like i love pushing people and bringing them to stage in super condition but at the end of the day if you if you get them so dug out and low that you know, I know how it, I know how it feels to be that low in body fat and it's not fun. Um, and unless you're very mentally, re mentally resilient, 
you're going to come out the other end with some issues, uh, whether it's, you know, your tendencies to food, uh, your enjoyment of training um, just absolutely hits rock bottom. I've had some junior athletes that definitely have suffered that. And I've suffered that, you know, where your tra training is non-progressive. You're actually much weaker than you were, well, significantly weaker than you were in the off season. Um, sometimes you go in with gusto and you're like, yes, like this is a great day. And then you realize that you're, you're complete still and it's just nothing moves as the way it should. Um, so you've got to remember that you could put them off even basic things like training. Um, and that's horrible, man, because like, if you put a 18 or a 19 year old or even a 21 year old off training, that's like a lot of their, one of their most enjoyable factors of their day that you've potentially taken away from them for a long time. So I think that's super key. And then from my standpoint, there's a barrier. It's like a, a hard phase. And I actually talked about this with a client this morning who, who was actually completely irrelevant to bodybuilding, but he was getting in his job role, he was getting very attached to um, a certain process that's going on with his work where people are being fired and he was part of the decision-making process for these people being fired and he was getting very upset about it. And I was like, you've got to disattach yourself emotionally from that dude. Um, and this is the issue that I have with my younger athletes because I see a lot of me and them and I've become their friends. Um, and when they're close friends, it's hard because you're putting them through essentially hell um you're getting messages off them saying you know i'm go like going hypo and going for a short walk to the shops or something and you know that that's not fun and you know that that's brutal and hard and they're waking up in the middle of the night not sleeping well and you know how much like how much you're putting them through and there's an element of that you've got like i've learned slowly over the years to be able to switch off that sort of attachment to to these guys because it's it's so difficult um because like you want you want to make them feel good almost and that's that's not what you're meant to do as a coach it's not your responsibility um and in your head you're playing this battle between being the nice guy and being a guy that doesn't put them off the sport but also being a guy that has your name your brand on their hoodies when they turn up for shows and if they're not in condition that's kind of in your on your part too so it's, it's a pressured environment um coaching these people but it's the same for any sort of uh, level of the sport but more so for the juniors because there is there is a lot going on um that you can really start to hamper especially comparatively to not so much older athletes but experienced athletes experienced athletes i think is the biggest uh sort of difference between the two um so yeah i hope i hope that helps some people in terms of either coaching or or junior athletes themselves yeah, man, that was fantastic. And you mentioned how, and I totally agree, I, I coach a lot of junior athletes. I think I've got uh, two or three uh, bodybuilders this year, which for me as you know, juniors is a lot, and I have a lot more of the powerlifting as well. Um, yes. And it's a very fine balance between pushing to the point where they get within a proximity of the results that they expect, but not yeah. so far that they, you know, fall off the edge and all of those things that you discussed uh, occur. They're put off by the sport, they're emotionally uh, destroyed, you know, they lose yeah. their friends, their family, their jobs, all these sorts of things. Um, now, how do you approach managing the expectations with the athletes? Because like you said, many of them will most likely embody some of the uh, AJ Morris characteristics because they see you they're inspired by you and they want to be hardcore balls to the wall and you know diet when they you know shouldn't diet and push when they shouldn't push um, all those sorts of things because they're likely taking inspiration from you so how do you then turn around and say well I do this and what I tell my clients is do as I say not as I do um, how do you tell your clients well I do this this is me and for you you're in a different situation and then managing the expectations of their situation when they're a junior because uh, you do need to find that balance. How do you approach that? Yeah, uh, I think this 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 definitely comes down to developing the relationship with the athlete um, from, a, from a wider perspective. So understanding how they respond to, to certain situations, how hard you can push them based on what you know about them as an athlete, as a person, how they tick. Um, I think 
a lot of the time the people that say they can push actually can't push and the people that sort of a bit more quiet about it a bit more held back can definitely push um because that the ones that just seem to sort of crack on with it and not pull up this huge front that they are pushing or they are doing the hard stuff or they do want to do this versus that like the people that just crack on tend to be the ones that just respond the best when you just continue to sort of drop calories they they get along with it they've not really sort of got a second thought about it they're just doing the necessary stuff towards getting to the end goal um so so, so for me i think that's the the most important part is understanding the un, the individual themselves being able to respond to that um, effectively. So, and then I think almost like when I when I speak to my athletes and I think, okay, how, how am I going to put this into context? Because they're talking about something that maybe I would do. Um, I, I almost say like, this is why I'm here. Because a lot of the time there's stuff that I do that's not super right. And, that, and that's fine because I'm learning still. But I've learned from that. So I'm, I'm here to help you stop making that mistake. So like whilst you might have seen me in my last prep do super high steps all the way until the end. And yeah, that might have worked. But for you, it's not going to work because I know it's not going to work. I know you're going to lose too much tissue off your legs. And I know that that's not the goal. And I know that's not going to win you the show. Um, and if that's that's the case, then um, people should follow suit because they, again, have that trust over me in terms of making decision processes. Um, but I've not had too many occasions where people have sort of said, you know, um, uh, you're doing this. What like, why am I doing this? I, I've had quite a lot of situations where people will see me doing specific lifts and then immediately request them in their programming. And that's just a case of like, I think when we see people do stuff and, and, uh, we want to emulate it. Um, and a lot of people want to like, just do what I'm doing, thinking that that's going to yield the same results. When in reality, like they just need to stick to what they've got in their template, what they've got on their programming, what they need to do to get the necessary results. What's the working for them? Because obviously what works for me is not going to work for them. Um, so it's, but it's so similar across the board. Like it's why people are out there still copying what such and such IFBB Pro does because they want to look the same way. So they think that doing the same stuff will take them there. And ultimately... Like if you were to look at what I do or what some of the other successful junior bodybuilders or even higher level athletes have done, if you take that as a as a perspective on what you need to do from a work ethic perspective and what you need to do from a, a gather intensity standpoint and knowing how to train accurately with intent and execution, that's great. That's what you should take from 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 watching me train or watching anyone else train at a decent level. Um, but, but taking it from a pure concept of, okay, AJ squats this, I need to squat that to have the same legs when you're six foot five and I'm five foot seven, you know, it's just not the same kind of thing going on there. So yeah. Um, and that's sort of my standpoint on, on coming to conclusions with athletes on that front. Yeah, man. Awesome. And final question for you, how do you plan on making bodybuilding sustainable long term because like I sort of mentioned it's really funny when I see you and I'm watching you I do see a lot of myself uh when I was younger I was like fuck this kid reminds me so much of myself like just (laughs) whatever I did I was all in on it and nothing else in life mattered um and that's not to say that that's the case for you but uh, I did get the blinkers on when I was passionate about something Um, And like I said, as I've gone through life, I've acquired responsibilities, things change as you go from a junior, you know, obviously into an adult and beyond, Um, things change. So not only how do you approach the sustainability side of things for yourself, um, but also with your clients. Now, I know your situation is very different to mine, but... Um, in many regards, sustainability is what makes for great bodybuilders, right? We talk about, you know, uh, density, muscle maturity. The longer you're in the game, the bigger you can be. Um, the better yep. you can be on stage, the more you can navigate preps um, and just get yourself in really good positions to win shows. So what are your perspectives on sustainability for your own training as well as your athletes, your junior athletes? Um, are we talking specifically about training or just the lifestyle itself with bodybuilding? It- 
everything, all encompassing, because I think, uh, yeah, you can't really have one without the other. From an overall standpoint, like in terms of um, just creating uh, an overall like uh, balanced approach to things, I think understanding that uh, at some point, you know, you're not going to be able to potentially do the things that I'm currently doing in the gym quite constantly. So maybe I'm not going to be able to squat forever. Maybe I'm not going to be able to deadlift forever. Um, having an awareness that there's not a single exercise that I have to do to be able to make progress, I think is key because I think where I've seen a correlative correlative issue with some experienced bodybuilders get injured is where they have taken that route where they think that there's one exercise that they really do have to do. And even when that exercise is causing significant issues, they continue to bat through that exercise until they do get seriously hurt. Um, so I think if, from my perspective, from a training aspect, I need to be aware that uh, if I do need to swap out moves as I get potentially stronger at them, therefore risk of injury goes up um, or just my ability to perform them goes goes down, then I'll have to rotate. Hopefully I don't. Um, I'd love to be squatting and deadlifting for a long, long time, but we'll see. And if I need to make changes, I will. Um, from a from a bodybuilding standpoint, it's actually interesting, like, the, the shift that I've had this year is, is definitely towards more of, and I don't like to say balance like too much because there is balance to things, but ultimately like when bodybuilding gets like down to the nitty gritty with things, um, even in an off season phase, it's not really a balanced sport um, to take it to the extremes that a lot of competitors do. Um, and even people at the top, um, have commented on this that you know it's not actually that balanced and the day itself for a bodybuilder is is hard to fit in much around you know your work your meals and your training it's hard to do a lot on top of that when you're super committed and you want something as bad as you know professional status or professional wins etc you've got to really take it seriously so um, that's obviously at the forefront of my mind but I've definitely done a lot more um, since being in a relationship, I've I've gone on more of like vacations. I've been traveling more in a relaxed manner where I'm not thinking about being perfect with my food all the time or being perfect with my training sessions. Like recently went to New York in November and I didn't train for like five days and I ate whatever I wanted. And that is like a far cry of what I'd have done literally a year ago to that day. So I'm quite impressed with myself from that standpoint because – it was nice. Um, it was nice and it wasn't good for me mentally. It made my work when I returned to things much better um, because I'm very like absorbed in my work as well. Like I'm the type of person that I'm not I'm not selfish to the point where I just just train and eat. Like I take my work very seriously and I put as much effort into my my business and my work as I do my training and my nutrition. So when I switch off from everything, like that week, I really did switch off. It did help a lot. Um, I think people don't take that for granted, how important that is. Um, and you learn to start thinking about things like, okay, well, there is actually a lot more out there to do um, and to live for than just you know, bodybuilding and sitting at a laptop doing check-ins, um, as fantastic as both those things are. So, yeah, and I think, again, this, the goal with this year is obviously another year away from stage. So it will be another year investing into not only my business, not only training, but also my relationship and and traveling more, um, learning more and uh, and just being able to, to flick the switch, so to speak, Jacob. I think that's an important thing. Um, and if you'd interviewed me literally like at the end of my contest prep, I wouldn't have said any of this shit. Um, I'd have said none of this shit. I'd have started telling you that balance is rubbish and that you don't need balance. <laughs> That's embarrassing to say, but it is what it is. Um, and I even see people now, um, like uh, one, one of his recent videos, you may know him, a, a big UK bodybuilder over here called Jordan Peters. Um, on one of his most recent videos, he, he literally admitted to the fact that he has been basically very selfish and made silly decisions at some point with regards to like family and things like that. He said it publicly on a video. Um and that he doesn't want similar people to like follow in those footsteps and make the same mistakes. Um, and ultimately, like he's, I told, I actually said this to him when I saw him the other day. I said to him, like, you're, you're where you are today 
partly because of some of those decisions, like partly because you have been relentless in your pursuit for just basically maximal muscle mass and maximal business growth. And you've got to where you are today as a result of that. And, and that's something to be commended for. But the fact that he's now admitting that he's also lost quite a bit out of that is is very, very commendable too. Um, so for young guys like me, hearing someone that I look up to like him saying that, who's as dedicated as I think you can be, um, is cool. And it's obviously, again, like from someone like yourself who's been in a situation like me, um, coming to the position you are now in a bit more of a relaxed fashion is, is nice to see um, and still yielding, you know, fantastic results from it. So, yeah, I think in the future I'll learn to balance things just more and more. I flick the switch a little bit more. Um, but when it comes time to sort of, you know, diet down and get ready for a bodybuilding show that there's going to be, there's going to be some selfishness and there's going to be some loss of balance. Now I know that. Um, so now's the time to enjoy things a little bit more, um, and be able to try and retain as much of that as I can throughout prep, um, within, within sort of a degree of, of sense, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, man. I think, uh, it's brilliant to hear you now appreciate uh yeah just that other side of of the coin uh, when it comes Mm -hmm. to bodybuilding because i I was very similar um but Mm -hmm. i i agree i don't necessarily enjoy the term uh balance rather it's priorities and trade-offs right makes more sense um yeah off season prioritizing other things outside of uh, bodybuilding is useful contest prep you know, bodybuilding just comes up the uh, the rank in terms of the priorities, right? Um, but AJ, thank you very much for coming on. There were lots of nuggets there. Guys, be sure to check AJ out. Where can they find you, man? Sure, it's um, a pleasure and like, an, yeah, like I said, superb to be on your podcast. You've had such fantastic guests on. It's an awesome, uh, awesome experience to be a part of this. So in terms of finding me, very simple. If you just search AJ Morris on, on YouTube, you'll find my channel, which also has basically all my podcast episodes in there. It's primarily a podcast at the moment, my YouTube channel. And I do solo ones. I do ones with guests occasionally and things like that. So you can check those out. Um, I have a website which does have uh, weekly video content on it um, from an informative and training aspect. So there's lots of workouts, workout videos on there. Uh, very similar to sort of Jordan's site, Trained by JP, if you're a member there, or Hypertrophy Coach. It's a similar concept, but prioritizing, um, supporting natural bodybuilding, getting lots of natural bodybuilders on there from, from my coaching and elsewhere. Um, so that's made by morriscoaching.com. And then simple on Instagram, I'm just AJ Morris underscore. And I just generally post mostly training footage on there um, with, with some informative captions. So if you like that kind of stuff, then you can follow me on there. But um, thank you very much for listening. And if, you have, if you've enjoyed it, then follow me elsewhere. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. No worries. Thank you, Jacob.